All right, and to finish up, um, uh, it's with great, great pleasure that I'm going to introduce our final keynote. Um, um, Maggie Breslin um, is a person that has, uh, through her discipline, through her creativity, through her intuition, through her insight, through her rigor, changed, in my opinion, uh, a substantial proportion, a substantial chunk of the way we think about how uh, we uh, do shared decision making and how we engage patients and why we do the work that we do. Uh, Maggie is a design researcher trained at Carnegie Mellon, and she's been, uh, she was a Mayo Clinic from uh, 2000, uh, 2004 until 2012. Uh, she is uh, she's a, a partner in crime, she is a collaborator, she is a, a fantastic researcher, and she's going to finish uh, this conference up with, with, with the fundamental, in my opinion, the fundamental theme of the conference, which is this notion of respect and dialogue and how we can get better through stories. Please join me in welcoming Maggie Preston. Decision making really around care, I, I think, in general. And for me, the, 
where conversation, the idea of kind of conversation came from is, uh, and the sort of focus on it, is that it's something that we can see change in the world. Uh, that that we, we, it's a place where we can see the change that we're hoping that happens from the decision tools that we create or the communication tools that we create. And some of you may, may not necessarily know this, but um, you've seen the issue cards a lot uh, in a number of different presentations while you've been here. Uh, and they're, they're beautiful, I'm very, very proud of them, but they, they, they didn't come like that from our heads. We didn't, they weren't the first thing that we, we created. Um, the very first thing that we created actually looked like this, and, and you can imagine it was, a, it was still cards, but it was a whole set of cards that around the different medications that we were offering. And we would, we sort of jokingly call these baseball cards in, uh, uh, in our group because there's so many numbers and it looks like stats and, and sort of that sort of thing. And we followed the sort of normal process that I kind of brought to the table, which was we shared these with people and um, we uh, got their feedback on them. And in general, patients love loved these cards. They really liked them. They, they were like, oh, this is great. This is so interesting and I didn't know this. And, uh, and we had uh, clinicians use them in clinical encounters so we could sort of see how they worked. And we, we kind of came back out and it occurred to me that nothing had really changed though. The, the, even though people liked them and they met you know, a certain set of needs, they didn't actually manage to change anything in the encounter. And so it was that kind of insight that if we are looking to make something different, we have to have something that we can look at to see if that change has actually happened. And that is really what conversation sort of became for me, uh, and I think for our larger team as we went on. We really took that metric, that sort of metric in the development phase. There are all kinds of um, outcome measures and things that are done in the, uh, in the larger studies, but those things can take years to collect and analyze and pull together. And, and what we really found was when you're just trying to make the tool and sort of develop the tool, you need something that you can see that indicates that you're affecting the world in the way that you would like to. And for us, that turned out to be conversation. And really it was, so what we then were able to see once we went through, this was actually the fourth iteration. Um, the, the cards that you see now were the, sort of the fourth main, with lots of small tweaks in between, but they were the fourth kind of big prototype iteration. And the big shifting change for us was the moment when we saw a conversation, a change in the conversation happen. So patients were suddenly able to ask questions uh, or make statements about their care, uh, uh, which really sort of uh, encoded things that were important to them and then allowed the provider to be able to respond to those types of things. So uh, this idea of conversation has been one of the sort of key tenets uh, that I take really to all my work. Um, idea of understanding what the conversation is like today and what might be like it to be like different in the future. Um, so some of you will probably have heard this story before, uh, especially if you've watched any videos with, with Victor, but, um, but I'm going to tell it again. It's a great story and I think you'll enjoy it either way. Um, so one of the patients who actually came through our uh, uh, randomized clinical trial for the diabetes cards was a gentleman, he was in his late 80s, and he was randomized into the trial with his primary care physician um, in our uh, community health group. And he came into the visit, and they got to the point in the conversation where they were gonna talk about their diabetes medications. And so the physician sort of held up the cards the way you've all kind of you know seen uh, the recommended way to do it, and he said, oh, which, which of these issues would you most like to talk about? And this 88-year-old gentleman said, oh, um, weight effect. And you can see on the videotape, you know, the physician sort of crinkles around the eyes a little bit and sort of hands the weight effects card to the patient. And the patient can kind of sense that it's, the doctor's a little bit surprised, so he sort of volunteers. He says, well, you know, doctor, my dog passed away a couple of months ago. And the, this man's a wife had passed away a few, a few years before that. He said, so I'm getting ready to, to move into the assisted living facility. And those places are full of single women. <laughs> and I want to look my best. And the doctor kind of laughed and, and he said, well, uh, and so if, if you've seen the cards, you've seen that the, the one that sort of has weight loss as, as an option is the exenatide. And, 
And so the physician volunteered, he kind of chuckled, and he said, well, you know, that one's, that one's an injectable. I don't know how you feel about shots. And the, and the man said, I don't mind getting shots. I mean, if you're getting shots in the assisted living facility, they send a nurse over to do it. And the nurses are really cute. And so, it, it, and so then the physician sort of laughed, and it became this kind of bonding moment. And then it turned out, in the United States, this patient is uh, on Medicare he's, he's, since he's 88. And at the time, this was a medication that was not covered by Medicare. And so the physician was sort of so uh, charmed by this exchange, though, that he actually, after that visit, did the extra work of filling out the paperwork and actually sending a letter to argue for this particular patient that they really needed this particular drug. Um, and this was a typical primary care physician, kind of on the edge of burnout, a lot of, you know, very overwhelmed by all the different things that they had to do in the visit. So what's interesting to this uh, for me is that this is when people, which inevitably we talk all about the process and we show the tool and we can show all the, the bar graphs and p-values and outcomes and things like that in the world, and at some point someone will always ask, well, tell us a story of, uh, of the cards that use. Like, so what they're really asking us is how do you know that they work? And this is the story that we tell. So why, what is it about this story that's really compelling to us? Well, for, for me, I think it's a couple of things. So one, it's kind of got the classic story twist. You know, it's got this moment where the assumptions are challenged. We all have our ideas about 88-year-old men, and it doesn't involve that they spend a lot of time thinking about their romantic life. But we all got, get to experience that challenging of our own assumptions, the same way that the sort of physician did there, and realization that we do have, that people have lots of dimensions, and those things don't, that people don't always fit into kind of our cookie cutter idea. Um, I think, I also love this story because it shows the value and tremendous importance of non-medical information. So none of the stuff that they were sharing was about A1C levels or what targets or those types of things. It is about a goal, but it's a goal that doesn't really use any medical technological kind of language. And I love that about it. Um, for me, it's also an example of something that, that I really believe, which is that um, the pathway to uh, a lot of this type of change, especially on the provider side, is to tap into that powerful feeling of what it feels like to care for somebody. To be able to respond to somebody's needs and be able to give them something that can help help them. Um, and I think that no matter, uh, every anybody who goes into medicine in some capacity is interested in caring for other people. And that part of what shared decision making uh, and can allow us to do is reintroduce that sort of act of caring. Um, and then lastly, I also really love it because the tool pretty much fades to the background. So when people ask us, how do you know that this tool works? I love that we tell them a story that's not really about the tool. It's about this exchange that kind of happens between two people. And, um, and I think that, uh, that, that the stories that we tell, I think, are, are meaningful. Uh, and so that tells me a lot about how we're interpreting the work that we do and what we think is really important about it. Um, more techie, please. So I really loved Gary's uh, talk um, the other day about media and health. And it sort of allowed me to frame a little bit of um, a feeling that I've been having around one of the themes that I see emerging from a lot of health um, media and newspaper articles and things like that, is this idea of technology is going to save us. Technology is going to be the thing that fixes all of the, all of the problems and challenges that we kind of have in the world. Uh, and I find that very disturbing um, uh, to, to kind of read and sort of see that. And, and I've had, um, I have had the experience of when we've shown the, the um, diabetes cards or some of our other tools uh, that we've created around shared decision making to journalists or other projects that I've worked on, I, I did another project that was really about a new room design um, at Mayo Clinic, which was you know the first transformative uh, room design change 
almost in 100 years, definitely in 50 years. Uh, it took us five years to kind of get it from early idea all the way to actually changing a 100-year-old institution, how they actually build things to get facilities on board with that. And I remember sort of showing it to, showing all these things to journalists, and their faces just sort of falling. They're so disappointed to find out that it's not on an iPad and that there's not going to be some glossy picture they can put next to it that just says future, future, future. And I'm really concerned that part of what we're, is being created is an expectation that good things will come packaged as an app on an iPhone. And that if we create that expectation, we may find that then when we have really wonderful, powerful interventions, we can't get people to accept them because they're convinced that they should look differently. And for me, it was part of um, you know, reading the article a, a month or so ago um, in the Washington Post um, about that, I want to make sure I get this, about health quality partners and the intervention that they had done. The article was called, that this was a pill, um, you do anything to get it. I don't know how many of you read that, but it, it talked about the, uh, their successful intervention that Health Quality Partners had created uh, around managing people with chronic, uh, chronic conditions, multiple chronic conditions, which was essentially sending a nurse to their home once or twice a week. And it had amazing outcomes, more, better than it really any of the other interventions that had kind of been funded in this way. And it was not, it was gonna, they were gonna stop the funding, they were gonna let it go away. And I worry that part of that is because, in some level, we just can't quite believe that sending a nurse to somebody's home, that that's what the future looks like. Uh, and that concerns me. Um, I'm scared because I think that, that getting people to kind of talk to each other is actually what a lot of this is going to look like. Uh, and that the technology may help us be able to do that, um, but it's a means to an end. It's not an end itself. Um, most difficult. So uh, we've done a number of the uh, decision aids now, and I think that there's a lot to learn from the ones that are really hard uh, and the ones where we just struggle to kind of make the conversation happen. And, and one of those stories comes from work we did in the preoperative clinic uh, at Mayo Clinic. And the idea was that we wanted to be able to offer smokers who were coming uh, through the preoperative clinic, so they were scheduled to have a, a surgery or a procedure of some kind, uh, wanted to be able to offer them a tool that would give them a little bit more information about uh, the value of uh, quitting, or alternately, we brought we had this, uh, this idea of kind of like quit for a bit, which was quit for a, a little bit of period of time before and after your procedure and surgery, which would help with wound healing and, and sort of your overall uh, recovery time. And if there is a version of a bloody battlefield in clinical encounters and shared decision making, I believe it's probably must be around smoking. <laughs> Um, because we went into the, these preoperative clinic and everyone was so resistant to having this conversation. The providers, um, whether it was the nurses and the physicians, but certainly the physicians, uh, and then the patients as well. And we struggled and struggled and struggled through iterations to try and come up with some key component that would, that would have people uh, be able to articulate what was important to them, to actually say out loud, I'm gonna keep smoking, or I'm going to, I think I'm interested in trying this quit for a bit, or I'm interested in trying, I'm trying, ready to, to try and quit for good. And one of the things that, uh, that we realized which really impacted me and, and sort of uh, got me thinking about, you know, this sort of next circle out from the work that we do in the clinical encounter and how do we begin to be able to uh, take it to the larger system was the realization that even if we, once we successfully managed to do it, to, to create a tool that would have people make a statement about where they were and what was important to them and what they were willing to do, uh, and say that person, it really didn't matter what they chose, actually, um, once they went into the hospital and were there for their surgery or procedure, because of protocols in that space, 
it would be as though the decision never happened. It wouldn't really be recorded anywhere. It wouldn't influence any of the other things that would happen. And a, and a smoking, no matter what you said in this space, um, a smoking secession, or, um, cessation, um, counselor would come and, and talk to you all over again about why you should quit smoking. And it was this real, uh, I had this real empathy for the, patients for the sort of people in this in this kind of equation that what it must feel like if you finally manage to work up the nerve to actually say what's important to you and then to not have it heard um, and then not to have it heard in terms of the actions that the larger kind of institution would take uh, and so that's really kind of kind of stayed stayed with me in terms of how do we begin uh, to be able to impact those larger systems and have and create caring systems um, that are responsive when people finally manage to find voice and say what's important to them. And the last story I have is about my mom. Um, so, um, gosh, <laughs> I've told this before and I don't usually get teary-eyed, sorry. Um, so about three years ago, uh, on a Sunday morning, I got a call from my brother uh, our mom hadn't been feeling well, but we didn't we didn't think it was anything. She'd just recently been to the doctor, and we, you know thought it was a sort of combination of uh, acid reflux and, and, and depression, um, which she had suffered from. And he called and he said, uh, "We're in the hospital, Maggie." And uh, I said, "Okay." And he said, we, "I brought mom in last night because she was she still wasn't feeling very well." And um, so the doctors just told us that she, um, she has a brain tumor. And I was obviously you know, shocked beyond belief. Um, and I got on a plane and I flew down to Dallas, Texas. I was in, in Minnesota at the time and I flew down to Dallas and uh, with, you know, there with my mom then when the neurosurgeon came in and said, you know, we're not gonna do surgery and I, I, I kind of like, well, of course we're not gonna do surgery. <laughs> Um, but it wasn't really a question, he was just kind of making a statement. And then um, the, the radiation oncologist came in and said, um, uh, well, we could do, we could do radiation, um, and that, uh, and at this point, it wasn't even exactly, it wasn't 100% clear what was going on, but it seemed like uh, essentially the diagnosis turned out to be that she had stage four lung cancer that had spread to the brain. And the tumor was uh, growing pretty quickly, and so her cognitive abilities were affected on an almost sort of day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and so you could still definitely talk to her, but it was getting harder and harder to understand what she was able to understand. And so, uh, and so the radiation oncologist offered us, um, you know, uh, radiation, and I said, well, what would the side effects of that be? And she said, headaches and nausea. And I said, well, those were, the <laughs> those were well, that's what she was suffering when she went into the hospital. So I don't, I don't know why we would give her that again. Uh, and then uh, we had a sort of long discussion with the oncologist, and, and we decided to uh, take her home. Um, and she, uh, we went home with hospice, and she um, passed away uh, six weeks to the day uh, after she had gone into the gone into the hospital. Um, but my mom had a really good death, um, and in large part, it was impacted by all of these other. Um, these all these other things that didn't have anything to do with the kind of medical community. So my father had passed away six years before that, uh, and it was sort of commonly my, my mom talked all the time about how much she missed my dad, and she talked a lot about the time when they were going to be together, uh, and um, how much she was kind of looking forward to that. And it was kind of a running, sort of running joke in our family that from a, when my mom was still pretty young in her 40s or so, she would tell us, um, we would say, oh, I really like that, you know, thing that you have. And she'd say, oh, well, you can have it when I die. We go, mom, you're not gonna, she's like, I don't, I'm not gonna live to be very old. So you, when I'm gone, then you can have it. And she was like, was very excited about it. We used to, we used to tease her. We'd say, mom, you're gonna live to be 100 because you're just, you, you're always talking about how when you're not going to be here. And I have to say that in the moment when she, we could, I couldn't necessarily talk to her and know that she understood what was going on, I was so grateful 
that essentially for 20 years, she had been telling us exactly what she wanted and what was important to her. And again, I think it's an example of sometimes you don't even know what the stories, how the stories that you share are going to be important um, later down the line. Uh, and that sometimes our attempts to quantify everything and get it a very specific place exactly the moment that it happens um, may not leave space for some of what happened with my mom, which was, uh, which was, you know, sort of a, a, it was an occasion where I felt extremely comfortable in those last six weeks um, doing exactly what I know she would have wanted. And so this, to me, I think kind of summarizes what shared decision-making or working shared decision-making or really working care sort of means, it, is it's really about ways that we can help people express and figure out what matters um, to them. And, and I think part of the reason why I'm sort of drawn to conversation is that I think a lot of that comes through in stories. Uh, and so it was really wonderful, I think, to see the, um, in Glenn's presentation at the, at the beginning, the sort of first keynote, the kind of language shift away from some more technical terms and language to talking more about mat what matters uh, and using that kind of language in terms of patients being able to articulate what they felt like was discussed in a lot of their conversations with their providers. So I invite you to, so those are, those are kind of this collection of stories that I think shape the work that I do and sort of the point of view that I bring to the table. Uh, and I would love to hear some of the experiences or stories that you all bring to the table that shape the work that you do. And then the hope is that in the sharing of those stories, that as we all leave and choose our projects and choose the things that we're going to work on and sort of collectively ending up shaping where the trajectory of shared decision making and where shared decision making is gonna go, that we can do it in a way that's a bit more informed um, about uh, where the other people in, in our area, uh, in our sort of topic group um, are coming from.